Hi, welcome to vlog number 111. This is the vlog where I talk about quarterly stories, which is my graphic novel that I hand write, hand letter, hand ink, and then hand to you, hopefully someday in print. But until that day, it's available serialized online at quarterlystories.com, where you can read it all the way up to page 52. Um, it's a very personal story to me about faith and mental illness. And this is the vlog where I document the process and the progress of creating that graphic novel on top of being a full-time art director, a full-time husband, and a full-time father. It can be kind of difficult to find areas of time to work on my comic and to try to make my graphic novel happen. And so this vlog is a way of me holding myself accountable as well as documenting the process as I do my graphic novel. Um, so. Speaking of challenges that impede your ability to make a graphic novel, oh, and what you're watching below me is me working on page 52, panel two of Quarterly Stories. Uh, so I'm still making progress on the comic. But uh, one thing that did impede the progress of the comic was two days ago on Saturday, um, I, I gotta back up a bit. So I live in the Antelope Valley, which is Lancaster, Palmdale, Quartz Hill, um, that whole area of California. Um, if you live in California and you've never heard of it, that makes a lot of sense. It's not a big area. It's kind of an outskirt city. In fact, I think it might be the furthest north city in LA County. So that goes to show you just like, it's, it's kind of a smaller city. Um, it's commutable distance from uh, areas like San Fernando and Burbank and LA if you're really in, down for a commute. And so because of that, um, people live there like myself and housing costs are really low. Um, there's one side of town that's really like super violent and bad. There's another side of town that's really pretty and nice and it's pretty quiet and just a pretty safe neighborhood to live in. However, um, it is the desert. It's uh, one of the few places in the world where Joshua trees grow. Um, it's one of the few places in the world where the, uh, the California poppy blooms like in, in full bloom. And so we have that, I think I've vlogged about it, but there's the California poppy festival where you know we have a, uh, a field that's, that's a big poppy reserve. And that's great, especially if you want to make opium. I'm kidding. But, um, but it is, so there's beautiful and terrible things about the Antelope Valley. One of the negatives of the Antelope Valley is because you're in a desert, um, and right now, because of the climate, uh, we are one of two locations, at least on this side of the U.S., that is in a heat warning, meaning that the heat uh, is going to hit such highs that are so consistent that don't even really cool off during the night that our entire city has been put on warning. There are like little centers with water and stuff like that that have been set up to try to help especially like seniors and other people who may not have access to a way of cooling off um, and you know the heat levels are so high it's actually pretty dangerous. So. We're going through that um, in the Antelope Valley, so it's been really hot, which is why right now, as you're hearing this, usually I'll turn down the AC a little bit so you can hear me more clearly, but, you know, being that it's, you know, about 105 outside right now, um, which isn't that hot compared to how hot it's been, um, but for now, that's where it's at outside. Because of that, I, I want to keep the AC pumping through my car because, frankly, I, I don't want to... It's, it's a toss-up between, like, sweating and melting in front of the camera, which might be interesting for you guys, or just um, having the wind blowing and interfering a little bit with the, uh, with the audio. So, anyhow. So, while you're watching me ink page, panel 2 for page 52, let me get into what happened on Saturday. So if you saw on the top of that thing, that is indeed 112 Fahrenheit. And that's a little cooler than it's been the last few days in the Antelope Valley. 
my wife and I are so fortunate to live in one of the hottest places on the planet. So Saturday, uh, my wife and I, you know, do a ton of stuff. We have to fix the swamp cooler, which goes out, which is how we cool our house. Um, and so we, I, you know, I battle with the swamp cooler for like a good four hours. Our, our house has gotten kind of heated up because of that. It's a bad time for the swamp cooler to go out. Finally get the swamp cooler fixed and like, an hour or two after we had cooled off the entire house, uh, the entire electrical grid for our entire block goes out, and then the neighboring blocks went out. So we were completely without electricity for, you know, from about 5 p.m. to, um, you know, 5 a.m. And this actually might sound like a small thing and maybe if you live in a rural area where there's not a lot of access to electricity although I'd imagine you're probably if you're watching this close to an electrical outlet because you know you, you, you had to have electricity get to your phone or whatever you know your, uh, your TV your computer whatever you're watching this vlog through so I think you get how annoying it can be to not have any electricity now, I'm no spring chicken or whatever, so I have definitely had um, electricity go out in apartments and stuff like that before. What I haven't had happen is that happen at a time where we're hitting record highs of heat that are getting up to like 115, 118, you know, degrees outside. It, it's hot. And to have your entire electric go out uh, was just a, a total in, insane experience. And I wish I could have vlogged it, except that my, my phone was low on, on batteries and I had no way to charge uh, my phone. So my wife and I trucked it out with her sister who, was, who had come to visit us and just feel bad for her. She had terrible timing in visiting us because like right when she got there, our, our electric went out, but it was also kind of fun and it felt like a little bit like camping or being a survivalist. But yeah, it was a rough night and the other downside was once Benji was in bed, which is usually my window to work on comics, I had no way to light the table to work on my comic. So I, I, you know, there's no electricity, therefore no light. And, uh, so I had to take that night off, but I made up for it with this drawing uh, that you're seeing below yesterday. So that's one thing. Another thing is uh, you might remember a thing called the sand fire from if you've been following this vlog for a while. It's early, early on in the vlog, somewhere in the 20s, I think, of this vlog uh, in, on the Quarterly Stories channel, um, where... I had talked about this massive fire that had happened in Santa Clarita and caused basically the freeway to go about a mile an hour. Well, it feels like they're kind of a seasonal uh, occurrence because guess what's happening right now? The sand fire. And um, that's not going to be pretty because uh, now that means that my drive home is probably going to be pretty insane and pretty packed. So, yeah, so that's fun. So that's one thing I'm kind of dealing with as we speak. So, so uh, there's a few things the sand fire brings up. Like, one is, um, it, it makes me miss my friend Kevin a lot because we had some pretty rad times, like uh, driving home from work uh, during the sand fire and just kind of got up to shenanigans and stuff when we couldn't get home. And so that was cool. That was actually a really cool experience. And about this time last year, Kevin was staying with us. And, um, you know, it just makes me actually miss my buddy because I, I realized, like, that was a really cool experience being able to have, like, a close friend of yours, like, live with you for a little bit. Um, you know, it was actually, it's, it's something I kind of miss. I'm glad that he is up in Portland with his daughter, kicking ass, uh, all of that, but I still miss uh, my good buddy, so so that's one thing. Um, another thing 
I, I'm just mystified by is like how often do fires happen in this area? It's insane. It's like they, they just everything lights on fire about this time of year every year. And then how do people live in that area if they know that like their whole house might just light on fire at some point? I don't know. It's it's a weird one. So anyhow, so there's that. Uh, another really cool thing that happened is uh, I've been accepted into the Los Angeles chapter of the National Cartoonist Society, which I am really pumped about. So I have to go and purchase some things in order to be a member and, uh, and whatnot, but I've been accepted, which I'm excited about, and I'm not quite sure how much I can vlog uh, from it because it is a little bit of a secret society even though it's not um but uh in, in that case i'm gonna hopefully share some stuff regarding the national cartoonist society um, chapter of los angeles but i am pretty pumped about it because um it was one of those things i think i mentioned this on a blog before but i was feeling kind of intimidated even going to those meetups uh I went to one meeting and was instantly interested because I felt just out and but inspired by everyone around me. That these are people who are like New Yorker cartoonists, who uh, are like the head editor of an entire comic book company, or like have movie deals, or are the head writer on like a serialized film. And I have friends who are successful and stuff in art, but in this particular situation, I felt just a little bit uh, out outclassed, like um, a little intimidated. And I'm really excited that, um, I mean, one thing I did feel was that my skill level was good enough to be in it. Like, I didn't feel super intimidated by skill. I felt inspired by other people's skills, but I felt like, no, I, I feel like my skill set's kind of there to be in it. But my resume, like, uh, you know, while I've worked for some massive clients, like, I've never landed a movie deal. Um, I've never really, like, won, like, a, a you know, Caldecott or something for, for art that I did. So, so it's, they, you know what I mean? It's just one of those things of, like, I, I'm kind of excited to be able to be a part of this thing and be able to talk to people who are, you know, fighting the good fight in making comics and uh, also just honoring it and respecting cartooning. Um, so that should be cool. I'll, I'll let you guys know how that goes, um, whether it's worthwhile or not. It seems like it's going to be worthwhile. Uh, the next meeting is the beginning of next month, so I'll either film a little bit or if it seems like an area where you know I'm not supposed to film or something like that then I'll just kind of uh, talk about my experiences and stuff getting into that so yeah so there's that and now I'm on my way home and I wanted to answer a question from Holly Brown who's a listener of this blog and also by her own right a super successful um vlogger, uh, like somewhat YouTube famous vlogger. Um, and so, uh, she's really cool. She's a, a, we had her on art casters last week. I kind of talked to her here and there and she's occasionally commented on the blog and stuff like that. But, uh, but it was cool, um, being able to really have a one-on-one -on -one or a two-on-one -on -one conversation, um, with her because she's just an inspiring and rad and very passionate about comics person but she had a question um that uh had to do with like graduate school and what my experience was like with graduate school and uh what made me i am i'm i'm, I'm kind of like unable to read the uh, question directly because i'm because i'm driving but it seemed like the gist of the question was like is graduate school worth it um, is it worth it to go for your Master of Fine Arts? And uh, she was considering uh, going for her MFA in, um, in something, and I, I thought I could give my own experience on that. So when I first um, 
applied for a Master of Fine Arts. I did it because I wanted to level up as an artist. And I think I also had kind of a, a bit of a fascination with like the fact that like once you have an MFA in art, like you can't go higher than that academically. Like the MFA is the biggest degree you can get um, when it comes to studio art. If you were maybe, I think, majoring in art history, that's the one case where you could get a doctorate. But, um, but an MFA is like the highest degree you can get. And so I think there was a part of my personality that just wanted to get the highest achievement I could uh, academically. And so I enrolled, and I think about two years into the process, so, oh, I should explain, so there's a big difference between an MFA and an MA. An MA is a degree, at least from what I understand, an MA relating to art is a degree where if you take the classes and you pass with like a C or above, um, you get the degree. Um, whereas the MFA is actually a much more complicated program um, with a chair and a committee that basically decides uh, and customizes your uh, studies. And while you have to take and pass courses, you're also developing a major body of work as well as a thesis um, while, while, you know, while you're working for your degree. The other thing about an MFA it, uh, is that you have to apply uh, for the program and not everybody gets in. And at the school I was going to, they were very picky about who would be allowed in the MFA program because they'd only have a few slots a year and it, it is a very um, time consuming thing for the teachers and the staff to have MFA students. Um, and they want to pour into those students because those students really reflect on the reputation of the school once they've given an MFA to those students. So the program I was in was really intense. There was a very uh, hard application process. Um, and then basically you go into this whole thing, but, um, and, and part of it's like you have to do advancement. So you do a couple years worth of work where you're refining your body of work and you put it before your committee and you have your advancement show where it's basically, um, it's, it's like the first samplings of where you're gonna go with your final art and your final show and your final thesis. And so a lot of it's about exploration and finding your style. But um, initially I was thrown off by the fact that the majority of people that I went to school with who were working on their MFA were getting their MFAs specifically so they could teach. And teaching at the time was not really an interest of mine. So after about two years, I had gone through the whole advancement program. Um, I had, you know, basically cleared the way. And, uh, oh man, my regular shortcuts actually closed off. So I have to, um, I have to actually take the freeway. I think that's because of the fire. That's too bad. So anyhow, I, I don't want to get too into it, but the point being, like, my I, I spent about two years in graduate school. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is generally to get a BFA takes about a year longer than a BA um, because of the advancement shows and the extra courses required in order to get that F, uh, the fine art, in your, um, in your degree. And same with an MFA. Like, an MFA can take an extra year to an extra two years to achieve. And uh, it, it really just depends on your own progress and your own schedule. Because most people, by the time they have an undergraduate degree, have some kind of steady work and can't fully devote themselves into school uh, to the extent that a lot of undergraduates can. Um, and so that, that's, just a, that's just another thing to kind of keep in mind uh, if you're considering an MFA. Anyhow, so uh, I dropped out. Um, 
after my first, uh, my second year, and I probably had about a good year and a half left to go to get my MFA, but I just at the time felt like it was BS and uh, was distracting from making art um, to make money, and I, I at the time felt like I didn't really have much to learn from these teachers, and that instead I, I felt like I was kind of like wasting my time. And I also didn't want to teach, so, um, and I realized, like, a, a huge reason to get your MFA is so you can teach at the college level, because most college, uh, most colleges, um, at least accredited art colleges, uh, really require you to have your MFA in order to teach, and oh my goodness, there is totally a fire again. It's crazy. Let me see if I can kind of show you guys a little bit of this. All right, well, I don't know how much of that barren landscape you, you got to see. It looks like it's mostly in Santa Clarita, which is back there. So it seems like it's probably in the Placerita area, which is that little shortcut I often am taking on these videos that you guys watch. Uh, poor Placerita seems like it just gets hammered with fires every single year. Anyhow, so um, back to what I was saying about MFAs. Like, so um, why I went back to graduate school was that by the time my wife and I had moved back to California from Portland, it was always kind of a regret of mine that I hadn't finished my schooling. And aside from that, I felt really called to teach. Like, I actually um, felt excited and interested in, like, the idea of leadership and teaching and leading other uh, new artists. And so, my perspective had changed. Aside from that, I had kind of underwent a lot of changes that you guys might have heard about at, on this blog, which is I used to be really passionate about paid art, getting paid to do art, getting paid to do my style. And what happened was I feel like I had kind of cracked the door open and was there and was getting paid to do my style. Uh, you know, most of what I was doing um, professionally was hand inked. It was uh, getting hired to do my thing. And frankly, I was really kind of sick of it. I had come to a realization and I, you know, I don't know if you'll have this realization, but I had come to a realization that doing art for money kind of sucks. And uh, that's no judgment on anyone else, I just mean for myself. It it really sucked, it was like not fun, it felt like a job, it was still other people's ideas being executed. I think the only scenario where I wouldn't have come to this conclusion would be if it was me drawing exactly what I wanted to draw and uh, not, not having to consider who it's gonna sell to because there, there was that. Like, I was making a pretty decent living off of t-shirts, most of which I concepted, drafted, created, and everything. And I'm still proud of a lot of those shirts. But the point being, like, it, it still was like making stuff that was, like, maybe funny, um, which, by the way, I love humor, so that, and I'm a huge comedy fan, so nothing against funny. But I just felt like I couldn't do what I wanted to do, which is, which was comics. And I also, when I was in Portland, came face to face with some harsh realities about the comic book industry. At least the side of the industry that I was interested in going um, into, because I met a lot of guys who had like picked up Eisners and were heroes of mine, and they weren't doing well. Like, um, and. They were all in scenarios where the comics that they did that made money were all the comics with the big two where they were having to draw somebody else's idea. The comics that they did uh, that did make money didn't make enough money to kind of live on. And so they'd have to subsidize it by doing exactly what I was already doing. So I just did the math and was like, I, I want to do this autobiographical story and um, and auto bio comics, and I'm never gonna have a window of time to work on him um, with, with the current profession I have. So there was that lure too, because I was realizing it'd be nice to like teach and have that be a source of income and be able to use 
use some more time to focus on work that I feel is art. So, um, so anyhow, so to answer that kind of question about the MFA, I would just ask, like, are you at a point where you don't want to do art for money? Because if you're wanting to do art for money and everything specifically for money, um, it may not be the best choice. Um, however, it's expected of most MFA candidates and MFA students that they'll be working professionally in their field, just as it is an expectation placed on most people who teach academically. But my point being, if your point of going to get your MFA is literally um, just to get better so you can make more money at art, um, I wouldn't do it. it. It's really expensive, it adds to your student loans and your, your debt, um, and uh, you can get grants and stuff like that. Like there's an advantage, like if you're a little older when you apply for school, you can usually uh, you know, qualify for more grants and loans. But, um, but yeah, I, like I wouldn't recommend it if that's your mindset. If your mindset is that you really want to explore your art and uh, get, into, get heavy into art theory and start thinking in a really heavy way about the theory and the reason behind your art and what your art is trying to say and where your art rests within the history of art and different movements and um, really like theoretically step back and start considering what you're exploring with your art and how you're pushing yourself and your style <laughs> to areas that are fascinating to you and really starting to try to kind of pin down and solidify what your voice is as an artist uh, because most of the BFA, um, I, this is how I've heard it explained by a lot of professors, um, is when you're a BFA student, you're like a sponge. You're absorbing as much information about anatomy and color and lighting and composition and basically anything you can get, you're just kind of soaking up and absorbing so that you can use it later when you go out and professional field. Um, as an MFA student, you're coming in with those skills. So the point is to start making a body of work that's representative of everything you've ever wanted to do in art. I don't know like if all MFA programs are like that. I, I can only really speak from my experience in the Cal State Long Beach School of Arts MFA program. But for me, that was really cool, and that's what I got out of out of graduate school. Um, what you're also going to get is some of the le like smallest amounts of sleep in your life, and uh, if you're with a good committee, they're going to push you to uh, to push your skill level to a point where you almost might feel like you're going to break. Um, I know for myself, I had a few months where I thought that I was completely going to lose my mind. Um, when I was in graduate school, and I ended up with stronger work for it, but it, it, it is no easy task. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of homework. It's not homework most of the time that's fun. It's like real work. It's fun because you're exploring, and uh, it's also fun because of who you're in the program with. Like for me, I got inspiration in both of my experiences with the MFA program with the people I was in class with um, and sharing studio space on campus with, that uh, that experience and that interaction with my classmates was really invaluable to like informing and honing and pushing my skills to a different level. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of my take on uh, graduate school particularly um, the MFA programs for an artist. Uh, and I hope that kind of answers um, your question, Holly. And if you have more specifics about it, about like what the experience is like, I can definitely tell you uh, most people are in the program for about three years, um, which is pretty long for a graduate program. A lot of graduate programs will only be two years uh, because it's just a master's degree and so you take the courses and 
if you get a C, great. If you can, you know, and it's and it yeah, that's the other catch is, uh, you know, most master's programs also are all all pre-scripted and written down on paper, much like your BFA or your BA program, where it's like you look in the um, in your uh, catalog for your school. And they have like, you take this class, this class, you check these things off and you're done. Whereas with graduate school, a lot of that is formed by your committee. So there's a certain amount of coursework you're expected to do, but your committee kind of decides whether you need to take something again or not, uh, whether you're heading in the right direction or not. So if you pick graduate school, really make sure you pick a really strong committee. That was it that was me inking the page I kind of got a little bit into graduate school I hope that kind of answers some of your questions I highly recommend it like I said before if you're going into it for the right reasons um, so anyhow my progress on my page right now is looking pretty good this is panels one and two I'm gonna try to ink this guy tonight and uh, I will see you guys next week Hi, my name is Benjamin. I tell you can this all you try. You can drink this up to sing track. I guess come on. Okay, where are we going? <laughs> Hi, my name is Fredman. Number three. So movie number two. Oh, movie. Hi, the movie. That's it on TV. Actually, it's a TV. That's it. All you want. What's what together? You tell me what you do. They think you. They say I do the tickets. I tell you tickets. Party. He said, party is I said, what? You can buy a very much. You can buy a very much. You can buy a very much. And you can put your baby animal. When you go, when you go, you first and you wash your hands. You can buy. You push your and you wash your hands. When well, you know, when well, you know, something when you understand. I come in, okay? We are done. Let us see. Let's read. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see.